All right, so I, uh, I closed everything here. You can leave it open if you like, but I closed everything. I closed the emulator, I closed everything. It doesn't matter. We'll get to it again. I want to focus on looking at these um, handouts. So let's look at the first handout. They're going to be numbered. <coughs> They're going to be numbered. So let's go ahead and, and open number one. So the way all of this works is uh, the very, very first step I've got here is set up Node.js. Now, how many of you before this class have heard of Node.js? Very few people. Node.js is a runtime environment that lets us create a variety of projects. Node is sort of one definition of it is that it's kind of like an app store. It's an app store in that you can download and install various projects, various frameworks to let you do different things. So we need to install Node to then be able to install Taco and then use Taco. So we will use Cordova, also known as PhoneGap, to take our humble website projects and evolve them into full-featured cross-platform mobile device projects. Taco is software that smooths out the rough edges of Cordova by helping us quickly set up all the myriad software for hybrid app dev. If we go look at the doc documentation of PhoneGap or Cordova, it's going to tell you, download Apache Ant, download Java, download Android SDK, install it, set your path. Lots of work to do. Um, Taco was created by Microsoft to, speed, uh, to smoothen out all of those rough edges. Um, we still need the base, which is, uh, which is Node. So here it just goes on to say, you want to go to this website, download the software, and install it. We don't need to do this part at all. This is already done for us. But if you want to do any of this at home, and you can do this at home, and I recommend it, because again, you, you, you use it or you lose it. If you don't do it, you're going to forget how it works. And then to get back into the groove of things, it'll be a little tougher. You want to go there, and it's going to be either ver node version 4, X, or version 6. I'm going to recommend here the version 4 because it's an LTS. Does anyone know what LTS stands for? Long-term support. An LTS release often means that it's very stable. Everything's built on top of it. It's going to be supported. Um, 5.x might have sort of been like an intermediary version with brand new stuff where they're testing things. Version 6 is not marked as LTS yet. So version 6 is the newest one, but I'm still going to recommend version 4 because it's long-term support. It's a longer-term version that is more rock-solid. It's not as experimental. So you would go on to download it, install it, and you have a brand new item in your Start menu. Try this. Click on Start and type Node. Now again, mine is weird. Mine says Node EXE, but you should see one that says Node JS command prompt. If you start typing node in your start menu, you should see an entry that says node JS command prompt. Go ahead and click it. That looks pretty much the same as the command prompt, but with a little bit different styling. So Node is something we run from the command prompt, also known as the terminal. It's right here where we're typing commands. After we've got Node, we need to set up Taco. Cordova is a framework that lets us write code that we're familiar with. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, also jQuery. And translate it to code for Android or iOS or Windows Phone that it understands. It's what allows us to upgrade a simple web app into something that can access the features of our device and be distributed in app stores. I want to put my app over on Google Play. I want to put it on Apple iTunes. I want to put it on Windows Marketplace. I want to actually give it away or sell it. 99 cents, 5.99, whatever. I want to give it away or sell it. We'll be able to also tap into Amazon. We'll be able to put our apps on Amazon as well for free or for pay. 
Taco will let us do that. In, in the eventual final commands, we will do uh, Taco build release. And we will create the release ready version of our code, ready to go to the app stores. Modern Cordova requires a bit of command line interface work. So typing commands. We will use Taco that makes the initial process easier than ever before. So again, we don't have to do this. We've already done this. We would go into our node command prompt. We would type npm, npm install dash g taco dash cli. That's already done for us. We've already got the taco software. In your command prompt, if you have it open, type taco space dash v. V is in version taco space dash v. Enter. We're at taco version 1.2.1. It's the latest version at this point. Um, okay, so on step three, here in the command prompt, there's nothing we could do. We can't, we can't click on anything, you know, oops, I mistyped taco. You can't click on it to go back and edit it. Whatever command prompt you have right here is where you're working. You can't go back to edit something back there if you typed it wrong. It is right there, the command prompt. This is telling us, in my case, I'm on the C drive, in the user folder, in the instructor account. Yours most likely is C <coughs> users lab. You're in your lab account. So mine will be slightly different because I'm an instructor account and you're a student lab account. But here on, on Windows or on the Mac, I would simply double click a folder to go into the folder. We cannot do that in the command prompt. We have to type a command to open folders. So whenever we're in the command prompt here, just ignore everything. You might as well put your mouse away. You're not going to use anything mouse related really here. Here in the command prompt, type dir. Dir is directory, which basically says, show me what's in this directory. Show me what's in this folder. I'm in the instructor folder, and when I typed dir, it tells me, oh, you've got You've got a downloads directory or folder. You've got a documents folder. There's the desktop pictures. There's different things here. This is how I can tell what's in this folder. That would, that would have been the same as if I had double-clicked that icon and looked at here. Look at that. That's the same thing. In Windows, it's a nice pretty icon, my pictures. And over here, uh, you know, it's, it's text. There's the ZZ folder. There's my ZZ folder, in my case. There's my, <coughs> yours may be different. And no, I will not be able to double-click on desktop to open desktop. It's not going to work like this. We're going to type commands, a few simple commands. I have another handout which has like the six basic commands you'll need. For the moment, um, you're in your you're in your lab folder and here it's waiting for us it's waiting for input it's waiting for a command I want to switch from my current folder into the desktop just like there's a desktop right over here I want to go I want to open my desktop folder in the command prompt so type CD which is change directory I want to change from my current directory my current folder space to my desktop folder. Type cd space desktop. And uh, it usually does matter when you're in the command prompt about capital letters. <coughs> um, not so much in Windows, but it will on Linux and on the Mac. But here I've got a, do I've got a desktop folder. I want to change into it. Change directly to the desktop folder. Press enter. And now it should show you C drive, user folder, lab folder, desktop folder. Type dir to see the contents of that directory again. Whatever is on your desktop shows up there. Uh, 
Aptana Studio 3 link, Aptana Studio 3. Cisco Packet Tracer student, Cisco Packet Tracer somewhere here. Cisco Packet Tracer, right there. That icon that's on my desktop is right there in the command prompt. I'm in the desktop. If I open the desktop folder in Windows, Windows Explorer, if I go into a folder in Windows here and I want to go back, I can press the back button of, of my browser to go back, obviously. In the command prompt, there's no back button. You need a command to go back. The command to go back, to go back out of the folder is cd space that dot dot. That's a shortcut to take you back one level of folder. I've gone into the desktop. I want to go back to the lab folder. Actually, let me do this so it looks exactly like yours. I'm in the desktop, and I'll do cd space dash dash, and now I'm back on the lab folder. dir to see the contents of your lab folder. If I wanted to open then the downloads folder, the documents folder, all of these are directories. If it's not a directory, it doesn't have directory. If it's not a folder, so Octana Rubles is a folder, videos folder. I can type CD videos, CD space videos, enter. I'm in the videos folder. DIR to look inside of it. There's another folder called Logitech Webcam. CD Logitech Webcam. So I'm just kind of navigating around, opening folders, going in and out of them. It took me back to videos, CD dot dot, it took me back to lab. So going in and out of folders. In Windows Explorer, my flash drive is drive F. If you have a flash drive plugged in, you'll be able to do this. If not, don't worry about it. But I've got a flash drive plugged in, and in my case, it's drive F. In the command prompt, I might want to jump to my flash drive. I'm on the C drive right now. I want to jump to the flash drive. In my case, it's F. So I would type F colon enter. I'm on my F drive. If you've got one plugged in, try that. Maybe yours is G or D or something. I, I don't exactly know. You'd have to check what your Windows Explorer tells you. Mine tells me it's on F. So all I typed was the drive letter. I'm, my drive is F, happened to be F. F colon enter, I'm on the F drive. And I can confirm that by typing DIR. <coughs> and so the command prompt tells me here's the stuff in your folder, podcastaccounts.txt. Mm -hmm podcast account dot text if I go back if I want to go back to the C drive C colon enter I'm back on the C drive I'm showing you this we're going to do it several times to get used to this that we are going to need to use this and believe it or not a lot of modern web developers, front-end web developers, even app developers um, are using the command prompt more and more and more. It's often faster, more efficient. Instead of waiting seconds or minutes simply for the software to load, command prompt opens in a jiffy, type a command, and do it. I have to have the commands memorized, of course. In the old days when you got a computer and it had no graphical interface, it did come with a nice thick manual, of all the commands that you had to memorize or look up, and then you could manage in your computer. Um, now we just click an icon and we do it. 
But like I'm saying, believe it or not, a lot of the modern tech startups and a lot of big companies, you're seeing this a lot. Open up your command prompt and create a project, a modern web project, an app, etc. And we have this, this uh, that we're doing in this class. This, this that we're doing here, we could do it in Visual Studio. Again, 30 gigabyte download and then we're ready to go. This is a lot faster and more efficient, but it requires the command prompt. Let's see. Oh, one more thing. Your, uh, do you see as you're typing all of these things, you do have a history that you can go back to. You can go back in history to some point. Back to your current command. And let's say I'm typing commands, dir, and I'm typing cd, desktop, and all of that. Let's say I'm, I'm doing these commands and so forth. We're going to see that it's going to be very helpful to remember that let's say I'm typing a big command, so don't type this, but let's say I'm typing uh, taco build android dash dash release dash 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 key store etc etc. Let's say I'm typing a big command and then I press enter and then it, it fails because I, I typed something wrong. Let's say I, I typed it, oops I made a mistake, I gotta type it again. I'm gonna type it again and I have to type all those letters again. No, actually, we do have a, a shortcut here. I can retrieve my last command on the keyboard. can't show you my keyboard, but press the up arrow, and it brings back your last command. So I can bring back my last command, and then use my arrow keys. Again, I cannot click here. I cannot click to edit that. You can in Windows 10. This, these are not Windows 10 machines. No, I can't click there to edit that. I have to think in terms of arrow keys on my keyboard. Pressing left on my keyboard to go back to that spot to fix tacon to taco, and so forth. Arrow keys. If you press escape, you cancel the command. But if I want to bring back my last command, I press up. Actually, I can keep pressing up to bring back the history of the commands that I've typed. So if you have to type a huge command, instead of retyping it and typing it wrong again, you're going to see that we can quickly press up to bring back our last commands. Press enter and it executes it. Let's say I brought back a command. Actually, I don't really want that command. You can press escape on the keyboard to cancel. So we're going to need to get used to typing things in the command prompt. Here's another shortcut. Again, this that I'm saying, I'm going to give it to you in another handout soon. Let's say I'm in the lab folder and I want it to go to the desktop folder. I would type CD desktop. I'm already tired typing. We have a shortcut here. As you're starting to type, for example, CD desktop, I can press tab and it'll fill in the rest. Not so bad with desktop, but what if I wanted to type CD, Adobe Flash Builder 4.7? Well, as soon as I start typing Adobe space Flash and tab it, it will do the rest for me. Adobe Flash Builder. That one's a little trickier because it's got spaces and all this stuff. But we can press tab to help us type the rest of the command. Question? I got lost going all the way to C. Oh, okay. Well, uh, the easiest answer will be just close the command prompt and open it one more time. That'll take you right back to your starting point. Mm -hmm. If we were on Linux, we could type cd tilde and it would take us to our home <coughs> we're not so let's say uh, you know we're gonna get used to this it's not gonna be so difficult we're just gonna need to know a few commands back to the handout
slash slash dot takes you back to your home screen, your home window. It took me to C drive. We wanted to go back to our users lab folder. So um, the um, the thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to follow some of these here. I want to go to the desktop and create another taco testing kind of project to see what we have. At the beginning of the day, we just quickly did taco create my project. I want to do it a little bit more legitimately. So in the command prompt, cd space desktop enter I want to create this project on the desktop last a moment ago we created in in the in the user folder which we can get to but here just to help us find it easily we're gonna switch to the desktop so cd space desktop press enter notice the command Taco create test 01. This one's a little bit different. Taco create. This thing can be called anything test 01. That's the name of the folder of a brand new project we're creating. We can create multiple projects very quickly. Space. This is what will allow us to specify a few features of our project. Um, eventually, when we get this to the App Store, we need to have a unique package identifier. Have you ever noticed that over on the App Store there's a lot of calculators, there's a lot of weather apps, there's a lot of a single kind of app, and a lot of them are named exactly the same thing. This one's calculator and it has a picture of a cartoon calculator. This one's calculator and has a picture of a high-tech calculator. This one's calculator and has a picture of a person holding a calculator. They've all got the exact same name. The way they're all differentiated is by the unique package ID. Let's type com dot your last name dot test zero one. This is a reverse domain name. I don't actually own smith.com or victor.com or whatever. This for the moment is perfectly fine that I'm making this up, but this is what identifies one calculator app from everyone else's calculator app. com.radapps.calculator is different than net.victorapps.calculator. This reverse domain name specifies this app, which I use the same folder name, is from this website. You don't have to have a website to do this. But this is what identifies it separately. The next option to the taco command in quotes, remember quote, end quote, and then with the arrow key I'm going to back up into the quote, I'm going to write test, capital test, space 01. That is going to be the name that appears on the icon. We never specified it earlier today, so it called it Hello Taco. But now we're specifying my app is called test1, or anything we want, we put it in quotes. At this point now, we can press enter. And here's one thing I notice beginners do all the time. You don't have to be at the end of the, of the line to press enter. You can be right here in the middle and press enter. It'll take it. You don't have to waste your time going to the end to press enter. It even works on a web browser. Address. Pro tip. So type in your command. It'll give us our feedback. Earlier, you might remember that that said name, hello taco. ID was, I think, io.cordova.hello taco. Because we specified a name, which is the last parameter of the command, and because we specified the ID, which was the second to last, now it's got a name and ID unique. And I've saved it to the location on my C drive on my desktop. If you kind of move your windows around, there it is. That folder on my desktop, that's my project.
it's about 1.3 megabytes so far but that project right there is your whole project on your desktop we're using taco kit 3.0 it's the latest version of the code don't worry about it it's the latest one creating a new Cordova project success we've got a blank template quick commands change this directory to your project add a platform install build tools add Cordova plugins connect to a remote every if you miss these commands you can always get them back with taco help try that for a moment type taco space help taco space help tells you taco tools for Apache Cordova version 1.21 taco is a command line tool that works by typing taco and various commands we did taco create a moment ago there's templates and all of this stuff help docs etc remember taco emulate Android it's one of the built-in commands in order for any of this to work step one is we create the project Step two is we go into the project folder to do any other command. That's what I have on my handout. Type the taco create command. Check. Type cd test01. Type the name of the folder you created here. If you called, if you did taco create my project, clearly you type cd my project. This option here, this parameter is what's the name of the folder. So cd space test 01. Again, if you call yourself something else, type what you called it. You can stray and call your things whatever you want. Perhaps in the beginning, follow along. And then as you understand it more, you can do variations. cd space test 01. Command prompt should tell you, now you're in your test folder in the desktop in your lab folder. Let's see, next step. Type taco platform add Android. Wait for completion. So again, we've done this before. Uh, taco platform add Android. Enter. We created a shell project that was 1.3 megabytes. It was not very interesting at all yet. Now we're adding the features of Android. Enter. We're going to skip number six. Don't do number six. Taco install dash rex Android. Um, what that command is for is for then to add more of the more of the features of Android all of the ancillary software because like I said there's a lot of there's a lot of items that need to be set up in order to get all of this working properly the cool thing is that with taco install rex install requirements taco will do all the hard work for us with taco install rex, it, it downloads everything, it sets it all up, it's ready to go. I have here that then we would need to close the command prompt, typing exit and launching it again. You don't have to do that. This would be something at home. If I'm starting brand new, you do need to do step six. Here, it's done for us. So don't do step six. Can you say it's done for us and you've done prior to this? Yes. Okay. I've come in and these computers have that image, it's all done for us. All right, so this is giving me feedback. Um, Taco Platform Add. Adding platform, adding Android, running blah blah blah, creating Cordova project using Android, etc. Android 22, copying template, blah blah blah, something about a whitelist, all of this stuff. Success! The quick tips. So again, we won't we will not do six. Six is done for us in the lab here. Next, we're going to type 
taco, plug-in, add, Cordova, don't type it. I've got a copy and paste for you in a, in a moment. This section here, number seven, we'll be able to do it very quickly in a moment. Number seven is for our project to now be able to access the camera of a device, globalization features for multiple languages, vibration, our app will be able to vibrate, putting a splash screen, doing the in-app browser, file transfers, we're adding plugins. The default Taco, the default Cordova app, doesn't let you do any of that. The default Taco app is very limited. It's still a web app. But by doing this command, we will be able to f access all the features of any device. Because every device, Windows, iPhone, Android has a camera. <coughs> Windows, iPhone, Android can vibrate. All of them have file, <coughs> you know, memory cards and such. We have that. Now, the shortcut here is, if you go back to the network folder, I have that whole big chunk of commands ready to copy and paste. If you go back to the network folder, it's all there. Edit, select all, edit, copy, and then on the command prompt, control V will not work. You have to right click, paste. <coughs> Go back to the network folder. There's a file, a file there called Cordova All Plugins. Copy and paste the contents of that file, copy it, and then in the command prompt, right click. You can't control V because what will happen is you'll get the escape character control V. <coughs> you want to right click, paste. We're about to add camera features, status bar, vibration, notifications, network info. Paste that in and press enter. This will take a little moment. This is going to connect back to the node mothership, basically, and grab all of these plugins, and add them to our project. Yes? Exactly. Exactly. These features are only working for this project. The one we made earlier don't, doesn't have these features. We would have to do this command on every folder project. I have a question. Yes. So, we have Node.js command prompt, and the, the command, regular command prompt. So, why use the Node.js? It seems the same, right? It's basically the same, the Node command prompt and the command prompt. It's basically the same. Um, there's no big difference. I wouldn't worry about it. I just usually just go directly to command prompt. The same thing. All right, did everyone get that? This is a little time saver, copying and pasting. It added all of these plugins. Type taco plugin. This will just show you. These are the plugins you have active on your device. I forgot to do it before we added the plugins. Before we added the plugins, it would have just said you have one plugin, the whitelist plugin. Now we've added camera plugin, advanced console file transfer, all that cool stuff. And later on, we'll be able to add a plugin for Bluetooth, a plugin for a QR code reader, a barcode scanner. There's lots of plugins to give our humble web app all of these cool device features. Some of these plugins, these basic 21s, come basically officially from Cordova. But anyone out of their garage can program a Cordova plugin and give it out to the world to add to their to their projects just like any open source project <clears throat> all right so what we did was type taco plugin to confirm 20 plugins type taco space platform to confirm Android 411 you can do that if you want It'll tell you our project 
is Android enabled. Our project folder has grown from 1.3 megs to 17.5. All of that extra Android code has bumped it up that high, but still, that's still not very big. 17 megabytes for our project, and eventually when it gets compiled, it goes back down again to like 2 megabytes. So it's not going to be a very heavy app. Most of it from the plugins, but then also we should have checked the size as soon as we did Taco Platform at Android. That would have bumped it up, I don't know, like 10 megabytes. And then these plugins added some more. All right, so then let's type Taco Build Android. Taco Build Android. Build, compile the Android version of my project. If we had added the iOS uh, framework, we would have simply have to do Taco Build iOS. We cannot do this, of course, because we don't have a Mac. If we did Taco Platform Add Windows, if we were going to create an app that we wanted to to be a Windows app, you know, Windows Windows 8 or Windows 10, a real installable app on Windows, we would be able to do Taco Build Windows, and we would have a Windows version of our project. Yes? So when you add that line, Taco Build Android, iOS, we have to do it separately. Actually, if you simply do Taco Build, it'll go through all of them. If you've added, if you've done Taco Platform, add iOS, add Android, add Windows. Here, then, I can do Taco Build, and it'll do iOS, then Android, then Windows. Right now, I'm being specific to say, build me the Android version. It'll do them all if you simply say Taco Build, Android. And you mentioned you have some difficulty with Windows 10. Is this the point that you have to At this point, yes, actually. Um, Yes, we've got Java version 1.7. You'll need to install 1.8. You need 1.8 on your case, perhaps. For us, ours works. I've tested it. It works. Again, I just tested it on a laptop, a clean Windows 10 laptop, laptop yesterday. And at this point, when I did Taco Build, it failed. It got a big, red, scary fail. And I was up there like 45 minutes checking online, what does this mean? Eventually it was, well, you've got the wrong version of Java, which is weird because this has always worked out of the box on all these laptops and tablet and uh, computers that I've tried. Suddenly last night it didn't, but I found out the issue. Mm -hmm. So again, try this at home. Run into problems. Email me about them. I want to know as much as possible to help people. Bring your laptop. We'll see if we can figure it out. Is this build or install the Java 7? What installs Java 7 is back here. Taco install Rex. Ta Taco install requirements. We'll download Java 7, 1.7. We'll download and install everything, and that's worked like 99% of the time. So we've already done this. I've already done this for all you guys. Taco install Rex. Therefore, our build did not fail. Mine took 20 and a half seconds. It goes faster the more times you do it, because notice all this file output is saying this library is up to date, this one is, this one wasn't. If I were to do it again, don't do it again, but if I were to do it again, it's not going to take 20 and a half seconds. It's going to go a little faster because all of my you know, supporting files have already been compiled once. See, all of them are up to date. Three seconds. So the first time I do it, it takes a little longer, subsequent times a little faster. As I make more changes to my project, well, it needs to update more files. So sometimes this goes, this happens in a few seconds. Sometimes it happens, you know, in 60 seconds or more. Taco build Android. The first time you do it, I've noticed that often you get a pop-up from the Windows firewall. You want to allow access. Sometimes errors happen here. And 
it's just so weird, but as I've tried this on so many computers in so many years, and other people's computers, sometimes simply doing the command exactly the same again works. Don't know why. Sometimes restarting the computer and doing the exact same command works. Don't know why, but it, but it works. It's, it's finicky sometimes. Excuse me. Yes. If I Yes, we're going to, I'm going to check with you just one moment. Let me finish these couple of steps. We'll be there one moment. Um, okay, then we come back again to Taco Emulate Android. I want to see this in, in the device. So let's try that. Taco Emulate Android. If we had the iOS version, we would type Taco Emulate iOS. If we had started to build the BlackBerry version, Taco emulate BlackBerry. So let that load up. Now, I had closed my emulator. I closed everything to start fresh. The downside of doing that is that you have to wait for the device to boot up again. Depending on the power of your computer, your, your main computer, booting up your device may be quick or not. And we're going to see here that as you try to do this at home, some of you will have a pretty good experience as we've been having here. These computers seem to be relatively good. This stuff works pretty well. People are going to try this on, a, on an Intel i3. People are going to try it on a Pentium, on a Celeron, on, a, on an AMD, on a Mac. They're going to try it on so many different ways. And some are going to go really fast, and some not so fast. And on some, unfortunately, this will, none of this will work on your computer in some instances. And unfortunately, I can't help you. Your computer can't handle it. Because what's happening here is, basically, you're running a mini computer in your main computer. This thing in your pocket is a mini computer. It has RAM, storage, CPU, processing power. It's a mini computer in your pocket. And to be running this inside your main computer, sometimes, it doesn't work, especially if you've got an older computer. You know, an ancient computer that's two years old. Well, not that young, but... The newer computer that you have, the better. And again, I've tried it on a variety of different computers. The one that I tested it on yesterday was like a 2005 computer. On this point, it was going, it was trying to start for like 10 minutes and I gave up. But it loaded it up on my real device, no problem. On my main laptop, it's about one year old, two years old. This happens really fast. I can run two of them at once. One emulator and another one at the same time. Do you think that's more of a CPU? It's going to be everything. You need, this, you need the CPU with multiple cores. You need a lot of RAM to specify for each device. And so this looks exactly the same as before. If you click the app icon here, it'll tell you you're running test one. Mine still remembers Hello Taco. These little things are going to remember. It's not that every time you turn on this emulator it's a brand new environment. It remembers. Well, not in this lab because we've got deep freeze. But on your own computer, everything you do to your little emulator, it will remember it. The old Hello Taco app is still there and I just ran if you go back to the home screen, to the apps, oops, if you go back to the apps, Hello Taco is still there, but if you swipe over to the next screen of icons, there's test one. So what would be really cool is if the school would pay for touch screens, because then you'd actually be able to touch this like a real device. We have to use the mouse, so you have to tap and hold and swipe. You have to click like a tap. You know, tap and hold, just like you would on on the on my home screen here. I can swipe over. I can swipe over here too, right? Swiping. Tapping, swiping, tap and hold.
this whole process that we did here was to create a brand new empty from scratch project. Um, the beauty of this is that this folder right here, that's our complete project that we can take we can take onto our flash drive and take it home. Nothing special. Just drag the whole folder to my flash drive and I can take it with me. Wherever I have a computer with Taco, this version of Taco, we can just fire it up and start working. So whatever, whatever we do in class, we'll be able to take it home and work with it. And what we have is, if you look at the handout, the actual code of the project is wherever the path is inside the project folder. Let's look at this. Go to your desktop. You can minimize the command prompt for a moment now. And if you if you created the test project on the desktop, it should be right there on the desktop. If you didn't create it on the desktop, it might be it might be down here on the explorer. So if you don't see it right away on the desktop, it might have ended up in the explorer. But if you double click your test project, we're going to look at what all of this stuff means. The important thing for the moment is open this www folder. This looks familiar. HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So in this folder exists a website. Everything else out there, we'll talk about what everything else is. But this is the this is the magic of Cordova Phone Gap Taco. I need a website and Taco takes care of the rest. That's an index file, editable in Notepad. This code should look familiar. I see a head tag, I see links, I see divs. There's a CSS folder with a CSS file. There's a scripts folder with, an in with a JS file. Images. Oh, there's the Cordova image. We're going to look at exactly what all of these files are in these folders, what do they mean, what do they do, etc. But your setup, the whole point of this first handout is this is the basic setup that you need to do at home to get into this development environment. You can do this on Windows, you can do it on Mac, on Linux, there's variations. Um, but overall, this sh should work pretty much as my handouts say. If, if it's not, again, see me. We'll try to figure it out for your environment. But sometimes you try all of these things and it still doesn't work. And unfortunately, sometimes that happens. It just doesn't work because whatever bad luck or your computer setup. Question? All of this takes about one gigabyte. Well, what I mean is when you do taco install rex, the requirements, all of those requirements take about one gigabyte. The size of your actual apps is not that big. We saw this one here is 22 megabytes. So I haven't really seen a project that's, you know, 100 megabytes. Most of these projects are going to be pretty small. So it's just the software that takes a lot of space. That's one gigabyte compared to, you know, six gigabytes for Xcode, you know, four gigabytes for Android Studio, 30 gigabytes for Visual Studio. The taco stuff just takes about one gigabyte. So there's those links for your reference if you want to look at cordova.apache, taco.visualstudio. <clears throat> Let's start to look at handout number two. I'm going to close that one for the moment. I'm going to close my I'm going to close my emulator. I, I see that it works. I'm going to close it usually we're not going to be closing it because it takes a moment for it to come up again. Usually we'll just let it hang out there and use it as necessary. But for the moment I want to close it for a reason. I'm going to close that. And let's look at handout number two. So my first handout is 
Node.js Cordova Taco. The next one is set up AVD. Let's open handout number two. Android software is open source, freely available for your projects. Okay. I had a note on number one that if you have a problem at a certain point, like right here, if you're trying to do Taco Emulate Android and it doesn't work, you might have to go to Campos number two, set up a AVD. So sometimes you're doing my steps here and it fails possibly at nine or ten. So oftentimes the way to fix it is to look at my handout number two. It's in, it's in two sections. Set up Android SDK Manager, set up virtual device. So SDK is the software development kit. Basically, this is the code, this is the Android code, the Android operating system. Um, Google didn't invent it, but Google bought it at just the right time, and now Google, it's Google's code. Google has the main code, they put it out for the world for Motorola to use, for Lenovo to use, for Huawei to use, for HTC. The Android operating system code is open source. You can download it, you can look at it, play with it, change it, put your own icons and all of that, and make your own phone, basically. The iOS code, on the other hand, is not open source. You are allowed to use it, but you can't reverse engineer it. It's proprietary. It's locked down by Apple. Uh, the Windows Phone code is also like the Apple code. Microsoft has it locked down. You can't really look at it and edit it and change it. You can use it, but you can't change it. The Android code, you can use it, you can download it, you can edit it, you can change it. And you can manage it all with the SDK manager here. Let's take a look at what this is about. This is saying we're going to need to go to a specific folder and open a specific specific app. So uh, open your computer window at the top left. At the top left, double click computer. Then we're going to double click local disk C, the C drive, not the network. The C drive, local disk C, double click that. That's what this is saying here. This is sort of that shorthand. Go to the C drive, go to the program files x86 folder. Program files x86. Go into the Android folder, go into the Android SDK Windows folder. So if you see, you should see Android. Double click Android. There's only one thing in here, the Android for Windows. Double click that one. We have AVD Manager, SDK Manager. Then right click SDK Manager.exe and select Run as Administrator. You should see Android SDK. Don't double click it, you want to right click it. run as administrator. It should simply have you confirm. Just wait a moment. If nothing seems to happen, just wait a moment. You might have seen a flash of a black screen for a moment, but then it should have popped up. I think the very first time you do this on your computer, it'll pop up to say, are you sure you want to do this? Yes or no? You want to say yes, and then it'll take you here. At the top it says it's the Android SDK Manager. This is the screen where you can download and use all the Android code. There's a lot here to look at. My handout will tell us exactly what to do, but as an overview, we have a section of tools. You can close these little triangles here for a moment. You have a section of tools, and inside of tools you have various build tools and platform tools that you need. Some say not installed, some say installed, some say an update is, is available. We're not going to change anything here, it's all ready for us. But at home, my instructions will recommend for you what to do. Because this 
is where you can play with the latest version of the code, Android N, API 22, the 20, uh, 24, the 24th version of the code. Okay, so, so here it says, okay, here's version 19 of this build tool, version 20, blah, 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 25. Although there's now a 25.1.7. So don't worry about anything here just yet. Here's Android N, there's the preview version, Android 6.0, which is API 23. So all the different versions of Android back to 2.1. There's, there's nothing below that that's available to us. But if you've used Android, on a technical level, it's going to have a whole number like this, Android 2, Android 3, etc. And you're going to have these API numbers, which is just uh, you know, a sequence over all of the code. This is the, seven, the seventh version of the code, as opposed to you know, 4.0 is the 14th version. And then Android is also known by the code name, which are alphabetical suites. Um, there was Android Honeycomb, Gingerbread, Ice Cream Sandwich, Jelly Bean, Lollipop. Lollipop's in there somewhere, Marshmallow, Cupcake, Eclair, Kit Kat, the latest one. N nougat. So it's going alphabetically. What's that? Nougat is the latest official. It was just announced one or two days ago. Yeah, nougat. I thought they were going to go with Nutella. They went with Kit Kat. Why didn't they go with Nutella? Um, so it's alphabetical. I don't have them memorized. I remember them in either IPI version or whole number version. But nougat is the latest one. M was the previous one. Marshmallow. And then L, lollipop, so forth, backwards, all the way back to cupcake, C. So eventually it'll be Android O. I don't know. What's an O dessert? Oreo. Oreo. Android Oreo. What about a generic dessert? Because, you know, eclair, key lime pie, I don't know. So Android O at some point. N hasn't officially fully come out, but it's been named nougat. And so uh, it's telling us here, hey, why don't you download, and notice it checked it on for us, why don't you download the latest version of the Android code? We're not going to. We're going to use a more stable version. But here's where we can download the, all of these versions of, of the code. Um, if we look in this section, it says, okay, download the main code, download the TV system image if you want to make apps for Android TVs. If you look at over here, Andro download the Android Wear version. Download, download the watch version of Android. The Android code. The most complete version 6 has it bunched together. It says here's the documentation, here's the actual code, here's the, the emulators. These images are basically emulators download the emulator for the Android TV. So that, if we download it and run it, would create basically a TV inside your computer. A 1080p TV inside your computer. You can download the Android Wear emulator. It's already the emulator. The Android Wear emulator. It'll download and basically set up a little watch. The Android Wear watch on your computer. And then different versions of the same sort of thing. So we don't need most of these turned on. Um, we've got the ones that are installed that I've already done for us with Android 22, SDK Platform, and Google API, Google API Atom Image. That's basically what is allowing that emulator to run. I've already done it for us, but my handout here specifically says, here's what you need to do at home. You need to turn off all the check marks at home and only turn on the ones I'm suggesting here. You can obviously play with everything else, but for this class I'm suggesting these two things that I've tested over and over and work. And I'm saying at home you want to turn on this one and that one. The Intel Emulator Accelerator. 
the Intel Emulator Accelerator is down here under Extras. The reason that is useful is because, again, you're going to run a mini computer in your main computer. And these little computers often use a different sort of CPU, a different architecture than your main computer. Oftentimes these use an ARM processor, whereas your main computer might use an Intel you know, full-featured processor. You're basically running two different brains in the devices. So with this emulator accelerator, this emulator that you run on your device will be a little faster. Oftentimes when people try to do Android development and then they give up, it's because their emulator is so slow because they didn't turn on the accelerator, which of course is free, but you have to follow my instructions to download it and install it, and it's done for us already. At home, you would need to follow these steps here. This is one possible reason why when you try to do Android build, it fails, because you don't have the proper Android source code set up. Another, reas another reason why it might fail is because of the second part of the handout. You don't have a virtual device. We will learn, of course, in another handout how to run it on a real device. We're not going to do that yet today, again, because like I'm saying, I recommend to get a real device. You can get one. I got this one for $40, like nine months ago. You don't have to spend $500 on a device. This is $40. You can find them even cheaper, and they work just fine. You don't. This is Verizon. I don't have Verizon. I have AT&T. Doesn't matter. I have Wi-Fi. I can get Wi-Fi wherever. So $40 device or cheaper to work on a real device to test all the real features, I think it's a good investment. It's not a requirement at all. You'll be able to manage with virtual devices. Let's do this, then we'll take a break, set up an Android virtual device. We've already got a basic one built in, but let's go ahead and find out how to do it, because when you go home, you might not have one. I'm going to close this SDK Manager window. No. no, we don't do anything here. It's done for us in the lab. You'll need to check it and do it at home. Yes. So you don't have to install any of this? No, don't install anything. We have deep freeze. Whatever you do will get erased next time. So. We won't do any of this. And remember what I said about updating our software in the middle of production. This is telling us there's a brand new version. I don't want to update my software and break everything, so I'm going to ignore updates for the moment. You have these other ones checked on as well. When you turn these off, it'll it'll decrease the number. That's why my instruction here says um, it says turn off every check mark and then turn on just these two. All right, I'm going to close the SDK manager. We're not going to do anything with it. It's done for us in this room. It would be a waste of time for us to do it every time. I already did it for us. What I want to do instead is run my SDK manager. That way you can just double click. You don't have to run that one as administrator. So go back to this folder of Android SDK and double click the AVD manager, Android Virtual Device Manager. Double click it, you get a quick flash, and then it should bring it up like this. We've got a Nexus 5 emulator set up. That's why when we did Taco Emulate Android, it popped up the emulator and we were ready to go. On your own home computer, you might not have one ready to go. So here's my instructions. Let's create another one just to see how it goes. At the top you have a tab, Device Definitions tab, right there. This lists all of the ones already set up. This one is like templates. Look at that. We can create an Android TV, a 1080p TV on our computer. It'll probably run terribly because it also needs 2 gigabytes of RAM. We can try it. We can create the Android Watch. But we're going to create a relatively low-powered device. I like to have us create this one because this is a great test for your personal computer to see how well you will manage with Android development. If this low-level one doesn't run very well, you might have a hard time doing any of the stuff in this class on your current computer. 
because you're not going to be able to run a 10-inch tablet or a, a Nexus 7 or whatever if it can't run this basic one that I'm saying in my handout here. In my handout, I'm saying scroll down to find the one called 3.2-inch QVGA ADP2. There's more than one here. Unfortunately, let's scroll down, keep scrolling, and you'll find one. You'll find a template device, 3.2-inch QVGA ADP2, very generic, not ADP1. That's a slider one, whatever that is. A 3.2-inch one. It's going to be 3.2-inch screen, 320 by 480 screen. It's going to take half a gigabyte of RAM. Again, we're building a mini computer here. So if your main computer barely has 2 gigabytes of RAM, right now we're going to take a quarter of it just for the virtual device, in addition to what Windows needs and everything else. Click one time on 3.2 QVGA, and then on the right side click Create AVD. You should see a button that says Create AVD, not Create Device or Clone, Create AVD. This is Create a New device based on the device template. Click that. There's a lot to fill in here, but it's all in my handout. We could name this something meaningful, but that's fine for the moment. This is just a generic 3.2 inch device. We've already got this template on device. Leave that alone. Target here, I think in this lab, something still got a little bit weird. It's not letting us select the CPU, so you want to change your target to Google API, and then it'll let you select the CPU. If it's not letting you select a CPU, you have to select the CPU. Change your target to the Google API, and then you have Google, Intel, Atom, CPU. On a real device, I can tap to interface with it. That'll be annoying on my computer here that I have to move my mouse and click every single thing. I can use the keyboard for some basic things. That's what hardware keyboard, keyboard present means. If I need to type stuff when I'm testing my database, I don't want to click A, B, C. I want to type on my keyboard. So that's what that option does there. Every device has a skin, meaning how do your buttons look, your back button, your power button, all of that, how does that look? That's your skin. We haven't selected one, so we'll select the default one at the top. Skin with dynamic hardware controls. This will give us a way to do the power off, volume up, all that basic stuff. This real device that I have, has a back-facing camera and it has a front-facing camera. This low-end device that we're creating doesn't have the capability to do a front-facing camera, so I can't test the selfie capability very easily. But I can do back camera, or I don't have to have a camera on my device, an emulator or webcam. If I'm doing this on my laptop, your laptop, you most likely have a web camera built into your laptop. You will be able to use the camera of your laptop to test your virtual device. I don't have a real camera. You don't have a camera on your device, so we'll have to use an emulated one. It'll act like a camera, but it won't be able to take a real picture. Leave the memory options alone. Leave the internal storage, 200 megabytes, leave that alone but we need to insert an SD card if we want to fully test the camera. Let's say we're going to put in 99. Doesn't matter at all, it's just that I can quickly type 99 because my hand is right there. Any size SD card. They don't even make 99 meg ones anymore. You know, Ten years ago they did. These options, we don't need to worry about them at the moment. I'll get back to snapshot later, but possibly as you test this stuff out on your home computer, and it's very slow, one thing that helps speed things up sometimes is to turn on Use Host GPU. We're not going to use it in this lab. Our computers seem to be pretty good, so they can handle the emulator well. I've tested this on a variety of computers, 
and then only when it's slow, I turn that on, and suddenly it works well. Because what that's doing is, now, not only are we using the main CPU, the central processing unit of your computer, we're also tapping into the graphic processor of your computer. We're using like two CPUs to speed up your emulator. We don't need it on ours, so I'll leave it off. Snapshot, don't worry about it. Just click OK. It'll think about it. It may look like it freezes. Just wait a moment. It'll process it. It'll create a device. Just keep waiting. Even if this is not responding, just keep waiting. And it'll say, you created a device with all of these features. RAM and whatever. Just click OK. So all that I've been saying, I've been getting out of my handout. On the, va on the AVD manager, remember, device definitions are the templates, and virtual devices are the ones that have been created, ready to use. When we come back, every time here, we automatically have this Nexus one. Um, we can use it just fine. When you go home, again, you may or may not have one set up. We just went through the process of setting up a basic one. We've set it up and we want to use it. So click on click on the 3.2 that we created and on the right select start. Let's boot up this device. These options, again, this is going to remember everything you do on this device. If you change the wallpaper, it'll remember. If you browse on the web browser, it'll remember. If you install apps, it'll remember. If you want to wipe the data like a clean device, there's that button. This device if we want it to be exactly three inches for real on my screen, I can turn on this option to have it as best as possible create a real 3.2 inch size on my screen. I'm not going to do that because that's actually going to be smaller than you think. And if you put your phone right now on your monitor, that's how small it's going to appear on your screen. So we'll just use a scaled size. And again, launch from snapshots. So don't worry about it. Just click launch. I didn't change anything here. Just click launch. It's going to tell you it's starting to launch it. It might say some stuff. It might say something about hacks is working in emulator. It's fast mode. It may or may not. Don't worry about it. Just let it load up. It's going to load up a different version, a slightly different looking version of your, of your emulator. Wait a moment. Android is loading up. Click Start, wait for AVD to start. After AVD launches, you can close the AVD Manager. Technically, if I have a beefy enough computer, I can click on that device and click Start again. I can have two different devices running at once. I can test, um, I can test my app on two different devices at once if I want it. I'll get back to that in a moment. Let's, let's let this come back up. Mine might take a little bit longer because I'm also running my recorder and other things. I'm using up more of my resources, but you guys should get yours coming up soon. Yes. I have a printer. It's nice if you want.
Everyone. So, uh, what what should happen eventually? We have the Android boot up animation, and then eventually this loads up and it says "Welcome, wallpapers, widgets, etc." Just click "Got it." Again, if we had a touch screen, you can just click "Got it," but click it with your mouse. Got it. And then this is opening up a different variation of the of that Nexus of this Nexus virtual device. It's a lower powered device, but you can, you know, you can click and drag, you can click the uh, apps icons there, maybe open up the web browser, you know, click the web browser, it opens up a basic web browser. It's a real web browser. You can go to real addresses here. You know, this is this is real because the the Juno uh, you know the Juno craft has reached Jupiter if you haven't heard. So um, this is a real searchable thing. Yes. It's so basic. The other virtual device is a higher-end Nexus 5. If we go, if we were to go to look at the details of that device, it has more power and features. The one that we created was a very low-powered one, a very basic one, just to make sure if this basic one is runnable on your computer. Um, when we have Taco emulate Android, that will try to run the very first Android device that it finds. We can specify which version, which device to use. At the moment, I forgot what the syntax is, but we will be able to type something like uh, AVD equals, you know, AVD 3.2, something like that. There's a command, I don't remember at the moment, but we will be able to specify which emulator to use. What do you need to use? Device all the time? Well, that depends. If you have a real device, we're going to be running it on the real device as much as possible. If you don't have a real device, we'll, we'll run the emulator. Now, one good thing about the emulator is 
okay, I've got it here and I can test it, and it doesn't have all the features, but I can test it. Uh, one good thing about the device using an emulator is, if I go to device definitions, you know, I have one here that's like a four inch screen. Well, I'm testing my device and it works really well, but I don't have I don't have a 10 inch tablet and I'm not going to go buy a 10 inch tablet. I'm not going to find one for forty dollars. But I can create a 10 inch device and run my apps there and then test what they look like. Because the best way to test apps is to really test them on real devices. But we are all on a budget. I know I am. I don't want to go out and buy a tablet just to run these apps. If your computer can handle it, you're going to devote about two gigabytes to this device at that size, 2,000 pixels. So that's why we started with a very basic one. It's a three-inch device, and if it can if it can run it, good. You might want to try the more powerful one. Look at this. The Nexus 6 is going to take up three gigabytes of your RAM. So if your main computer has four gigabytes of RAM, you're going to turn in three. You're going to turn over three gigabytes <coughs> just to the emulator. Your computer probably will not really like it. Um, so the more RAM you have on your computer, the better CPU. Hard drive doesn't really matter since it's plentiful. You're running a mini computer on your device if you use emulators. In this class, after we learn how to set up a real device, you're going to need to decide. Do you want to run your apps on emulated or real? Or the web browser. Remember, we have Taco Emulate Browser, or Taco Run Browser. We could run our apps in the browser, but that's still not going to fully give us the full experience because the camera doesn't work the same way. Vibration's not going to work at all. Your computer's not going to vibrate. So again, you know, forty dollars at Fry's, this particular device. Do you mean like you need to test on all the Devices? It would be best. It would be best to test your apps on as many devices as possible. Because if you want your device to be downloadable by people that have a tablet, you should have tested it on a tablet to see what it looks like. We can exclude or we can target certain devices at the App Store. But if we want it to run well on, a, on the watch interface, you should download the watch emulator and use it to test your app. Version on that That's another thing to think about too. We have Android 22 and the latest one is 25. Mm -hmm. So there is also some difference there and that should be another thing to test as well. So this is the problem with trying to target many devices, even just in the world of Android. So many sizes, so many OS versions. It's just one of the things we have to deal with as an app developer. Uh, so test it out, swipe screens, browse web, keep the AVD open so we can uh, so we don't have to wait for it to restart. <coughs> Here's what we'll do and actually uh, instead of having a break we'll, we'll, we'll finish up in a moment here. Um, I'm gonna close I'm gonna, I'm gonna exit I'm actually gonna close that device in a moment, I'll give you a chance. On your computer, try to, to, to use one of these other devices. Before I turn you loose to that, um, I want to say that this project that we were working on right now together, you can take it with you on your flash drive or not. This is just a quick test file. We're not going to work with it just yet. But that whole file right there is your project. If you set yourself up according to my handouts at home, you should be able to open this file at home. Let me give you some advice here. I'm going to close. You can get back to the AVD in a moment. I'm going to close the command prompt. You can, you can either click the X on top or you can type exit. Let's try that. Let's exit the command prompt. Actually, sometimes it doesn't even listen. Close the command prompt. Let's say... Let's say you want to get back to your project at home. 
Let's say you put this test file in your flash drive and you want to use it at home. One of the fastest ways to get back to it, because we have the command prompt, but we'd have to do cd this and cd that, and we'd have to go into the folder via the command prompt. Sometimes that's a little cumbersome. A quick way is hold shift on the keyboard and then right click on your handout, and I have it on another handout, I mean the folder. Shift, right click the folder, and I have this on one of my handouts. You have open command window here. It's going to be a quick way to get you right into that folder via the command prompt. Hold shift, right click the folder, open command window. And wherever that was it, it automatically took you in there. Top of the black. So when you take this home and you say, well, how do I open it up in Taco at home? We will be able to do it by a CD, going into this, and going into your F drive, and all of that. Or the fast way, like I just showed you, shift right click. And I go directly to my project folder. So we've uh, started to open a can of worms. We're going to spend a couple of days on like basic structural software stuff. Then we're going to get into bringing our project from last month into this shell getting all of that to work in the basic way. Then we're going to start to add cool things like camera features, vibration, sound, all of that. Um, we'll see how it goes. So according to the syllabus, that's our game plan. Right? So this is what we're trying to cover next time. We'll also cover, next time we'll also cover, well, I've got a real device. I want to set it up to, to run it. We'll talk about that. I'll have a handout. Um, that's why if you didn't bring the cable, we wouldn't really be able to do much. So bring your cable next time. If you've got a device, Android device, we'll be able to set this up on a real device. Uh, any general questions then on things we've talked about today? All right, we're going to end the main lecture at this point. You can do lab time if you'd like. I'll turn the printer back on in just a moment. Again, you don't have to save, you don't have to test, take test one if you don't want. We'll start a real project next time. When we come back Thursday, we'll have more handouts, more lecture, and we'll keep going.